Kia ora tato, everybody. Uh, Bruce Arrell's my name. I'm the uh, director of the Goodfellow Unit, and I'm chairing the session tonight. So it's um, so tonight's pretty exciting. Um, we're going to be talking about um, uh, epiglyphosin. I had to uh, get our speaker to help me pronounce that tonight. It's got too many syllables in it, so um, that's part of the problem. Uh, it's, the trade name is Jardians. Um, and so we've got um, Ryan Paul. Um, he's a diabetologist at, uh, in Waikato and uh, president of the um, uh, NZ Society of Endocrinology, um, doing a lot of talking about uh, diabetes. And so he's going to be talking about um, the availability of it, which has become available through Pharmac from the 1st of February, um, the special authority was considerably relaxed after the original one that was put up. So it's fairly available to a wide range of people. And it's really going to be quite a game changer in terms of managing diabetes because this medication um, helps with uh, kidneys, hearts, as well as diabetes and in induces weight loss in many people. So it's quite unusual in terms of the things we've been dealing with up until now. I know the diabetes community um, is very excited about it. Our other speaker who's going to talk about the implications of it for primary care and what we can do uh, in primary care is Dr. Brian Betty, who's the medical director of the uh, Royal, College, uh, Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners. He'll be no stranger to any of you. And so he will talk for a a, a short while after um, Ryan has talked. So, Ryan, over to you, sir. Uh, th thank you, Bruce, and welcome to everybody. This is, is exciting. So it likely represents the biggest change in diabetes management for decades, um, and I'll go, I'll go through why. So I thought we'd just start off with a case that we commonly see um, in, in practice. Got a 58-year-old Samoan woman, um, long-standing history of type 2 diabetes, ischemic heart disease and renal disease. It does fairly well um, with glycemic control, HbA1c of 56. And you can see her regimen there on a number of agents, metformin, vilgliptin and glipizide, um, in addition to lantus as well, and a few anti-hypertensives. Anti and she comes to you and says, um, she hears that there's new medications to treat um, diabetes for Māori and Pacific people. And she asks, how do they work? Should she be on them? And what side effects do they have? So I thought we'll go through that as a base um, for our talk and, and keeping that in mind. Um, so while we describe them as new agents, some of them have been actually been used since 2005 internationally. It's great we've finally got them here. Um, we've been campaigning for a long time for this, um, but they are, are finally here. And you'd be aware that from the 1st of February, um, Empicoflozin or Jardians um, became available under special authority. Um, Dulaglutide is the GLP-1 agonist um, that has become funded. But MedSafe has, hasn't approved that. It's unlikely to be approved until the second half of this year. So I thought that we'd focus this talk on empagliflozin. Um, but when we talk about um, SGL2 inhibitors, they are the preferred second line agent after metformin in most patients um, with type 2 diabetes. So it's completely turning up the, the, the previous algorithm um, that we're aware of. And the reasons why is that they reduce glucose levels um, by novel mechanisms, and they importantly, they cause weight loss and do not cause hypoglycemia um, alone. So all of a sudden, you've got those big advantages over insulin sulfonylureas, and what the, the big plus is that they reduce mortality from cardiovascular disease and renal disease completely independently of the effects of glycemic control. Um, but just, just briefly, so empagliflozin um, will be funded under, under special authority criteria. And it's important to know at least a third of New Zealanders will meet the funding criteria. And now there's an ethnicity clause, which I'll discuss, and that's gone up to um, probably quite realistically close to 40% of your patients in your practice will be eligible. Um, so it's important to, um, I guess, get up to speed with this um, if you can. And also to realise that the funding criteria is not necessarily a proviso for prescribing. It does differ slightly from best clinical practice. And I'll go, and I'll, I'll go through that. So how do they work? Um, basically, in, in um, a patient with diabetes, um, or in anyone, 90% of glucose is reabsorbed by the sodium glucose co-transporter. So both sodium and glucose get reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, and that brings a whole lot of 
basically water and fluid with it. Now, it seems a bit of an oxymoron, um, given that patients have high glucose levels, but a really important contributing cause towards type 2 diabetes is its increased expression of SGL2 channels um, in the proximal tubule. So what happens? You get a whole lot more glucose and salt. That leads to problems with, with cardiovascular disease. Now, so basically you can tell patients how they work is they inhibit um, the SGL2 um, channels. So they make you pee out glucose and, and salt and water. And as a result, um, you get a reduction in, in cardiovascular and renal disease. And I'll show you a pictorial of that. There are likely other mechanisms as well, um, which I won't get into um, tonight. But here is just this um, pictorial um, with the, the normal glomerulus. The one thing I'll say about this is SGL2 inhibitors work on the afferent arterial um, primarily, whereas your ACE inhibitors work on the efferent arterial. So both have additive effects and both can be used together. And the reason, I guess, why we're excited about that is this is the SGL2 inhibitors are the first agents since ACE inhibitors um, to reduce, um, basically reduce the progression of diabetic renal disease. And both should be used together. Um, so it's been a, been a long time coming. In terms of the benefits, often the reductions in HbA1c are only modest. Are modest on average, it's about 5 to 11 um, millimole per mole. It's important to realise that the worse the renal function, the less of a benefit you're going to get in reducing glucose levels. But those benefits on reducing um, cardiovascular disease and renal disease are maintained. So it's still a benefit for a patient, even though it may not be reducing um, the glucose levels by much. And they don't, re they don't cause hypos unless they're used in combination with insulin and sulfonylureas. I'll go further more and talk about that. The weight loss is, is only modest. It's only about one to three kilograms. But on the other hand, it's a lot better than vildagliptin, which is weight neutral, and sulfonylureas and insulin, which are often associated with some, some weight gain. And here we get into, I guess, the, the benefits up and above glycemic control, which we're excited about. Um, in terms of renal failure, I've put the NNTs there, um, and they are for, for five years, just to put that in, in perspective. But we are looking at less patients going on to um, dialysis and, and dying from renal disease, which is obviously great when you think about the the high rates of renal disease we have in our country, uh, particularly Māori and Pacific people, and those benefits are additive um, to ACE inhibitors. Um, we've got reduced cardiovascular events and hospitalisation and death um, from heart failure. Now, those NNTs may not look um, overly exciting, but it's really important to realise that these studies weren't done to actually show that they reduce cardiovascular disease and renal disease. These were done primarily um, because of safety studies. Um, you may remember when rosy glitazone came out um, quite a few years ago to treat type 2 diabetes, um, and lots of people, I guess, had heart attacks subsequent to that. The FDA came out and said, if you're going to do studies for type 2 diabetes, you need to make sure you do large safety studies and um, with a large number of patients to show that they're safe. So all this data is based on on those safety studies. So it's also important to realize that there's actually no convincing evidence to date that SGL2 inhibitors prevent diabetic renal disease um, or cardiovascular disease. So that's gonna influence your, um, your decision-making. Um, it's also important that the NNTs are probably gonna be lower once we have studies which are powered to, um, to detect those long-term effects. So it doesn't come without side effects. Um, these side effects are predominantly due to basically peeing out um, glucose um, and, and fluid. So polyuria is a common side effect, um, but to be honest, it's only mild to moderate. Um, you may have some patients that you previously um, treated with dabacliflozin, which is a non-funded SGL2 inhibitor that's been available in New Zealand for two years and had some experience, or may have already started patients with dabacliflozin. I warn patients of this, uh, of, of the polyuria, but it doesn't really typically cause any problems. Sometimes in those with prostatic disease, they seem to be the ones that notice that the most. Um, that's only anecdotal um, from experience, but definitely not um, limiting to, to its use. Probably the, um, the most common side effects to be aware of um, is that of um, volume depletion and, and hypotension. So dehydration is a big one to discuss with patients. The biggest risk is those that are elderly, um, and I'd be very cautious to using in those over 85, if you've got patients on um, diuretics or ACE inhibitors or ARBs, just thinking about carefully, just warning of the, the, the possible risk. Um, you may get a transient decrease in EGFR, it's very similar to ACE inhibitor use um, that you get with that, and also the um, 
similar in that you get a similar degree which which does um, bounce back. So I'll talk about when it comes around to starting a patient um, on an SGL2 inhibitor empagliflozin, what do you do if they're already on ACE inhibitors or diuretics? The other common adverse effect is the increased risk of genital urinary infections. And it's more common in females and those with the background of previous infections. Um, so it is important to ensure um, good genital hygiene. Um, mycotic infections or thrush are far the most common. Um, that includes um, balantitis. Um, rare, um, I guess, severe infections are rare. Um, that includes pyonephritis. And there have been a, a few case reports of Fournier's gangrene, um, which you may or may not have heard of, um, which is necrotizing fasciitis of the peri perineum. So if you do have a patient that does have significant genital and perianal pain, particularly if it's out of keeping um, with the swelling and um, you know, their, their ov overall well-being, that is technically a medical emergency. Once again, this has been used in thousands, uh, tens of thousands, if not more, uh, probably um, a lot more patients. And it's only been several case reports. So it's just important to put it, put it in perspective. So we already discussed hypoglycemia. Um, if a patient's on, you know, if a patient's just on um, metformin um, or pioglizone or vildagliptin, these patients aren't going to have hypoglycemia by adding um, epigliflozin. It's only going to be those on insulin sulfonylureas. And to be honest, most patients won't need any reduction in the dose of insulin sulfonylureas. Um, I often think about, hey, if the, the glucose levels show that risk of hypos or they have an HbA1c less than 64, it does pay to um, reduce the insulin by 15 to 20% of the total daily dose. And sulfonylurea is often halving them as a good proactive move. And if you find that hypoglycemia does not occur, you can just increase them back up as, as required. There has been a lot of hype about the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. That is something I know that lots of people in primary care are, are worried about. Um, the reason for developing um, DKA is that SGL2 inhibitors do lead to a switch of energy substrates instead of carbohydrates being main form. There is a switch to fat. That's part of the reason why you get to weight loss. Um, and one, only, I guess, a take home message is that even though DK is rare, we're talking about one in 3,000 patients, okay, so you'd be unlucky for it to happen, is that glucose levels may be normal or only slightly high. So that if a patient's, basically if a patient's sick, um, and particularly if they've got symptoms of DKA, um, such as nausea, vomiting, or abdominal pain, um, it's, re it's important to have their um, capillary ketone levels checked. And if these are over 1.5 millimole per litre, then it really does warrant excluding DKA, um, which will require venous gas and obviously um, transfer um, to ED. Um, now, one issue that we have is that patients with um, on SGL2 inhibitors will not be eligible for funded um, keto meters. Okay, so pharma have come out and said that. So patient, I know some pharmacies are, encouraging patients to self-fund the KSN's dual meter, um, which allows you to measure ketones as well as glucose. Um, but in reality, for, for most patients, it's advised that they're, they're either going to have to attend the practice um, or ED to have their ketones measured if they're acutely unwell. Um, to prevent DKA, we're also recommending that all patients stop the SGL2 inhibitor when, when they are unwell, regardless of the cause, or two days before an elective procedure. And I must admit, primary care is probably going to be a lot more up to speed than secondary care um, on this. So it's important with that message getting across. Um, and then they can just restart the SGL2 inhibitor once well. The other, I guess, groups which are potentially at high risk of DKA uh, are those with type 1 diabetes or diabetes due to pancreatic insufficiency. I would not be using empagliflozin in these groups uh, unless you're under the care of a diabetologist. And those are previous DK or on a low carbohydrate diet, I'll say a very low carbohydrate diet um, for that, or um, significant alcohol use, but, but basically because both of those will increase your, your ketone production. So they're the, the basic the at-risk groups in terms of, of DK. I must I provide patients um, with sick day with information on sick day management. I've never seen it in the patients I use. Uh, I, I, used it in, um, but it's just something to be aware of. 
So when should it be used? I know this will be new um, to, to lots of people. A really important take-home message is that lifestyle management and metformin remain the first-line management in all patients with type 2 diabetes. And the reason why metformin is still in there, and it's still in there in pretty much every international guideline, is metformin also reduces cardiovascular disease up and above um, glycemic control. And also obviously helps with weight loss. And then we're thinking about when should SGL2 inhibitors be used as second line? We're looking at all patients um, with type 2 diabetes with either evidence of diabetic renal disease, um, and that may be either microalbuminuria um, and or low EGFR, or heart failure, or non cardiovascular disease, or those with a high cardiovascular risk. And that's using your current calculators at greater than 15%. And that is irrespective of their, of their glycemic control. Uh, I'll talk about where there's a mismatch with funding. But even if you've got a patient, say, with an HbA1c of 46 millimole per mole, these patients are still going to benefit from epiglothosin. It's still going to reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease and renal disease. And it's also irrespective of any of the other glucose-lowering therapy. So epiglothosin is fine in combination with any other glucose-lowering therapy. It's only when it, when it comes around to insulin and sulfonylureas do you think, hey, do I need to reduce the dose of, of those medications? And then we look for those patients without um, um, diabetic renal disease or cardiovascular disease who will benefit. And it's really those after um, who have a high HbA1c and uh, that's on metformin and lifestyle management. So you've still got those as, as first line and they're very beneficial in patients which are overweight um, or obese, but just with the weight loss. Now, I will say that they don't qualify for funding for this, and vildagliptin will likely be a more attractive option. And that's because at present, vildagliptin is the only um, glucose lowering therapy in, that, when in combination with metformin to delay the need for insulin therapy in type 2 diabetes. Now, that data may come out for SGL2 inhibitors and GLP1 agonists, but at the moment, vildagliptin sits, sits there. And so all, we do recommend all other situations that patients are offered to self-fund um, empiglifosin or dapagliflozin. And the cost, if they don't meet the funding criteria, and the cost is approximately $85 per month. And I must admit, I've been surprised in public how many, how many patients are willing um, to pay for this, um, even though you, you may assume that, they're, that they, won't, um, they can't afford it. Um, and so it's still, I guess, I think that discussion should be put across at least hey, this is medications available. So when shouldn't SGL2 inhibitors be used? Uh, well, basically, there's no safety data um, for enduring pregnancy, breastfeeding, um, those less than 18 years of age, or an EGFR less than 30 mils per minute. So they're, they're the, the big groups. If you've got a patient that you got on empiglifosin and their EGFR drops to less than 30 mils per minute, we would be recommending that you stop it. If you've got those which you're worried about the adverse effects, particularly, I guess it was spoken about dehydration, DK, or genital urinary infections, they're also a group, I guess, to be very, very cautious about using them. Um, the other one is those with recurrent renal calculi, uh, which is a potential increased risk. Now, this is important, going through the special authority criteria, because obviously this will govern a lot of your prescribing. Um, so patients must have type 2 diabetes. It's not approved for any other form of diabetes. And they must have an HbA1c um, greater than, than 53 millimole per mole, despite at least three months of regular use of any other of any glucose lowering therapy. And that may be metformin, um, it may be vildagliptin, it may be insulin. It doesn't matter which one, as long as it's been for three months. And they can't be on funded dulaglutide um, at the same time as empiglifosin. Now, I'll come to that um, when, I, when I discuss that later, because you may, what you, since your legatide is not available at present, you, you will not be starting all your patients on epiglifosin, and you can switch them over um, later, and we can talk about that in discussion. Um, but in addition to that baseline criteria, um, patients must be, have either Māori or Pacific ethnicity, evidence of diabetic renal disease, um, known cardiovascular disease or high cardiovascular risk, or a high lifetime cardiovascular disease um, risk due to onset of diabetes in childhood as a young adult. Now, Pharmac haven't come out and given an exact cutoff, but they're encouraging prescribers to use this in 25 years um, as the definition of, of early onset diabetes. And the, what I think what Pharmac have done 
quite well is that they've identified high risk groups. Um, and particularly, I guess, um, for the youth, we know that lifetime risk is always going to be low in these patients by default because of age. And so having that in there is also um, um, beneficial. So when, I guess, patients um, which should be offered a self-fund, um, and once again, you're basing this on clinically appropriate situations, it's all those with renal disease and, and uh, or heart failure or cardiovascular disease with an HP1C that's already a target. So unfortunately, they won't meet funding. Uh, or if they're already on geliglutide, which may be an issue like from later this year. Or if they're basically non maori non-Pacific ethnicity with an HP1C above target, despite metformin plus and minus beta-glutin. So that's still going to be quite a large group of patients um, to discuss um, using epiclofosin in. So in terms of what's available, um, empiclofosin is either available in the 10 milligram or 25 milligram tablets, it's Jardiance. It's also available in combination with metformin, and that's Jardia Met. Um, so you do have the option of combining it with metformin um, to improve adherence. You start at 10 milligrams once a day, um, or it may be in the five milligrams twice daily in combination with metformin. So it's still really important to metformin, uh, to continue metformin. It's still really important to keep going with, with lifestyle management. Um, you will be, um, I guess, ideally providing information. And I know that Bo Ringer has now circulating um, basically the information booklets, which is great if, um, to give to patients. Pharmacists um, will often have that information if it's not available um, in, in the practice. And that's really telling patients when they need to stop their empiclofosin and seek um, medical attention. And you can see reducing the other medications as required. I think what's important is also ensuring that you're reviewing these patients in three months. Um, you want to be ensuring, I guess, I think it'd be useful at that appointment to repeat their blood pressure, HP1C, and their renal function. You can then, if the HP1C is above target, increase the empiclofosin to 25 milligrams once daily or the 12.5 milligrams twice daily um, if you've got in combination with metformin. You might choose to increase the empiclofosin earlier than that, um, or you may choose to wait to the review, or, or at least wait a few weeks before you increase the dose um, and then ensure there's no hypoglycemia. Now, I will say that the, probably the glucose lowering effect from increasing to 10 milligrams to 25 milligrams isn't great, but you do still get an additional benefit. So if you go back to um, the case, and apologies for, if you didn't see this, this earlier. Um, so we've got that long-standing history there of um, type 2 diabetes um, with ischemic heart disease and renal disease. So all of a sudden you know that hey, this, um, Mrs. T is a great candidate um, for empiclofosin. So HP1C is decent at 56 millimole per mole. And you say your blood pressure is great, 112 over 76 millimeters of mercury as well. And then you've got um, basically a medication um, regimen there. Um, including, uh, I guess, metformin, viliviptin, glipizide, and lantus. Uh, we'll um, now briefly introduce um, other key messages from the guidance that we've updated in terms of the overall management of type 2 diabetes, and I'm more than happy to discuss this and when we come around to questions um, as well. So in terms of what are we going to do with her, I guess, other medications? So um, we'll jump into this. So one point that's really important, you want to continue the metformin, Obviously, it's important to realize that um, you do need to, and you'll be, all be well with this, I'm sure, reducing the dose of metformin according to the renal function. And also that there's no great benefit um, in doses of metformin above two grams per day, um, but there is a lot more adverse effects. So to be honest, I very, very rarely go above one gram BD of, of metformin. You're going to continue the vertigliptin um, as it's beneficial. You've halved her glipizide, and you've actually brought her lantus back to um, 0.5 units per kilogram per day, which I will discuss um, in, in further detail. But I know that we um, probably all guilty of just increasing the basal insulin um, further and further. But when you get to doses of 0.5 units per kilogram per day, that should be a very, it's a very important checkpoint for saying, hey, these patients need prandial insulin. If they need escalation of their glycemic control, that's all I'm going to do by increasing their basal insulin is likely contribute towards weight gain with minimal glycemic benefit. And Mrs. T want to continue her acupril um, because we know that that blockade um, of ACE will, will be beneficial in terms of renal function. And that's when you look at stopping other antihypertensives such as philodipine. 
Um, so you're going to prioritize the ace if you can. And you've also halved her, her freezamide. A lot will depend on, I guess, the clinical state in terms of what you're going to do with the diuretics. Um, but as a, for example, someone that I've got that's on, um, that seems to be uh, under good control with their, their diuresis, I often have half the freezer my but that you will come to that on a, on a case by case basis. So you review her in three months and her HBNC is 58 uh, millimole per mole um, and her blood pressure is 135 on 88 millimeters of mercury um, with an LDL of 3.2 millimole per liter. I guess also trying to induce in here is you're looking at all of her cardiovascular and renal risk and not just the um, glycemic control. And how would you optimize her management? and um, repeat HBNC. Um, it's just one to have, have a think about that. So she would be a good candidate for increasing the emical flows in 25 milligrams daily. Um, the target HBNC in most patients with type two diabetes is less than 53 millimole per mole. Uh, it's been that way, uh, I'll say probably for at least a decade, but I know there's still that hangover effect of um, believing less than 64 millimole per mole is the, I guess the target. And we recommend repeating the HbA1c every three months until you've got a patient to target. And if they're once at target every six months. Um, if we go back to the uh, to the case, I guess we now um, you're going to start lipid lowering therapy, given I guess her cardiovascular disease, and um, you've got them top percent. You want to maximise her ACE. Um, so obviously going up to 20 milligrams twice a day. So probably all familiar with this. None of the best practices change. It's just getting those messages across because we know that. Um, best practice does, isn't always equating use. But if you've got a patient with diabetes and hypertension, you're maximizing the dose of their ACE or ARBs before you're introducing another agent. Um, it's not, I guess, it's different uh, for a patient that doesn't have diabetes. Um, so at her next appointment, she's doing really well, but she brings her son along, um, who's 28 years of age, has a BMI of 38, um, and HP on CS 75. And how would you manage his type 2 diabetes? Um, I'm just got a brief blurb here. Um, you do provide education and support for lifestyle management and start metformin. Um, you go back to the basics. You still, they're still the first line, first line management. Now, I always start metformin low um, and, and relatively slow. Um, one of my bugbears is the number of patients I see that are labelled as being intolerant of metformin. I suppose they started off on a relatively high dose. And if you go back to low dose, many of these patients will tolerate uh, metformin well. So often I start off on, to, on two, just 250 milligrams daily. You also know with metformin, basically the maximum reduction you're going to get in HbA1c is about 16 millimole per mole. So all of a sudden, I know this guy's unless, and there are a few patients which have need a lot of lifestyle management, but I know that this guy isn't likely to reach target on metformin alone. So I'd think about starting a uh, second agent early. And in this um, patient, because he is overweight, empagliflozin would be a great second line agent, but it's not going to be funded in for, um, until he's had three months worth of therapy. So here's another situation you may just say, look, would you like to self-fund empagliflozin um, for three months before switching over? Now, Pharmac does have a special authority uh, waiver criteria for patients which self-fund empagliflozin or dipagliflozin that now meet target. Um, in three months' time. So you can use that um, if, if you wish to. So in summary, the key practice points I want you to remember about empagliflozin is that patients should be strong and considered all patients with type 2 diabetes with cardiovascular disease or high cardiovascular risk, heart failure or renal disease, it's regardless of their glycemic control and other glucose lowering therapies. Um, and it is also thinking about it when... Um, in best practice when patients don't meet the special authority funding criteria. The only time you really need to worry about the risk of hypos is those that are on insulin um, and or sulfonylureas that have fairly tight glycemic control. And I've gone over, I guess, in terms of a good ballpark um, for um, how to reduce those doses. And also thinking about reducing antihypertensives and, and diuretics for those at risk. Um, it is important that patients have a sick day management plan and realistically, probably thinking about in your practice, how can you, is there a way that when these patients are sick, that they can at least attend the practice and have a measurement of the capillary ketone levels if, if possible. Um, and then just being aware, when do these patients actually need to go to hospital? And those are going to be rare, but just being aware of them. 
And then think about, hey, stopping empagliflozin if there are significant adverse effects. There's no point pushing with it if um, the harm um, outweighs the benefit. I've briefly touched on these other, I guess, important learning points in terms of um, the rest of the management of type 2 diabetes. I think HbA1c target is always going to be individualised and agree with the patient. But thinking about, hey, in most patients, I'm looking for less than 53. And if I've got patients, say, on metformin, um, vildagupta and empagliflozin, I actually don't worry if the HbA1c is 45, for example. I know they're not going to have hypos. I don't even get them to check their glucose levels unless they're unwell. Um, so I don't worry about cutting back therapy um, necessarily unless they're at risk of hypos. Um, metformin uh, remains the, the first pharmacological therapy in type 2 diabetes. And I encourage you to start low and slow if the patient's having problems with, with adverse effects. And we briefly touched on just thinking about when I'm increasing the dose of basal insulin up, having 0.5 units per kilogram per day as a ceiling before introducing um, 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 prandial insulin. And so part of, I guess, the guidance is the aim is introducing or trying to really reduce clinical inertia. Clinical inertia is probably the greatest issue that we've got in the management of, of type 2 diabetes. It's worldwide, but also New Zealand. So it's thinking about introducing second line or, you know, a second agent early. So if the HbA1c is above 64 millimole per mole, thinking about a second line agent at the same, second line agent at the same appointment. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And also introducing insulin early. And we know that um, patients have insulin deficient need insulin. And if they've got an HbA1c greater than 90, they're unlikely to reach um, their glycemic target on, on all the oral therapies combined. So it's thinking about um, going hard and going early. So the overall algorithm has shifted. It's gone away. You're probably very familiar with our, you know, algorithm based on glycemic control. You know, if the H1C is above this, you do that. The whole management of type 2 diabetes is now moved towards cardiovascular and renal risk. Um, so that's what patients die of. That's what causes the most morbidity um, as well. So sulfonylureas used to be our old friends. Um, they're now moved down to third or fourth line agents um, for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And that's really because of the, of the risk of weight gain and hypoglycemia. And they have no benefit up and above glycemic control. Still remembering your, your hyper management of hypertension. It's great you've got empagliflozin, which will help a little bit. Um, but just remembering what your target blood pressure is. And we're still recommending less than 130 on 80. Um, if known, macrovascular or microvascular disease. If they're young, you may want to even go a little bit tighter than that, less than 125 and 75. Um, the target for those without complications at less than 140 overnight hasn't changed. You want to keep going on the ACE inhibitor um, or ARB. But also remember that ACE inhibitor or ARBs don't prevent diabetic renal disease, okay? nor does empagliflozin. So if you've got a patient with diabetes without renal disease, it's still fine to basically use any other agent, such as a calcium channel block or thiazide. Um, this management of dyslipidemia will always remain um, important. And I guess the other relatively new um, aspect that people may not be familiar with is that recent studies have come out showing that the benefits of aspirin for primary prevention, so I, I, those are no cardiovascular renal disease, are actually a lot lower um, and the risk of bleeding is a lot higher than patients um, without diabetes. So I very, very rarely use aspirin now in primary prevention and often I'm stopping it um, more than starting it. So just for those that aren't familiar, our new, I guess, guidance on the management of type 2 diabetes is out um, on the web, and we're trying to circulate that into all practices and get something that will sit within the practice management systems and health pathways as well. Um, it's a live document. It'll be continued updated um, as evidence and access to interventions change. There's a big focus, I guess, on all those aspects that I've just already spoken about. Um, including on when to act on abnormal findings in the diabetes annual review. One thing I find is that it's, that it's great how many patients get a diabetes annual review, uh, but it's not necessarily, um, things aren't necessarily acted on. Um, that's for multiple, multiple reasons. Um, it's really also about having the benefit of really aiming for our inequities that we, that we have in diabetes care. Diabetes probably creates some of the largest inequities for Māori and Pacific people in standardising care in terms of, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in a practice in Kaitara or Bluff, um, you're getting the same evidence, which hasn't always been um, a recommendation, hasn't always been the case. Um, so I'd encourage you to have a look at the, the um, NZSSD guidance. Um, there are overarching algorithms. We're trying to get those in PDF 
um, print forms. I know people are keen to put them up on their walls. And there's direct links in the guidance into relevant other national documents, such as you know the Ministry's Weight Management Guideline, the Diabetes and Pregnancy Guideline. Hopefully we'll embed some dietitians um, resources in there so you can print those off for your patients, as well as all the relevant NZTA and MedSafe documents. This is how the guidance looks. You can see how comprehensive it is in terms of what aspects of, of diabetes management it covers. And for example, if you want to go and find more information on how to use empiclofosin, you go into the non insulin medications. Um, then you go into SGL2 inhibitors. And there you find all the information, um, all the information there. So that's a resource which um, is basically available for all, everyone in primary and secondary care. Um, in the country. So I'd like to end um, just by saying best practice hasn't drastically changed, um, but the introduction of these new agents and the national guidance does provide the ideal opportunity for us to improve the care of all New Zealanders um, with type 2 diabetes and all the inequalities that exist in the care. I think um, diabetes is something we're often challenged with in both primary and secondary care and hopefully now we can use this opportunity to refresh our, our memories and implementation is going to be the key here, um, particularly reducing clinical inertia. That's what Brian is going to touch on in his um, talk over the next um, 10 to 15 minutes. But I'll be happy to take any questions after, after Brian's talk. I appreciate there may be quite a few. Now, thanks. Good on mute, Bruce. Bruce, unmute. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Ryan. That was brilliant. Um, Paul, our, our learning technologist, has put the NZSSD uh, link uh, into the chat box, so you should be able to see it there. Um, That's great. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the, um, the thing about clinical inertia I think is important. Uh, I knew this medication was coming from a few months ago, so I've been keeping a little list of patients, and I think we might even do an audit in our practice because uh, as Ryan says, 40% of our patients may be eligible for this medication. So there's lots of work to do. So Brian, um, the other thing I was going to say, we are planning on answering most, if not all, the questions, which may mean we go over time. This is being recorded. So if you want to get off into other things, you can come back and look at the recording. Um, but because this is such a new, important thing, we want to make sure all your questions are asked. So, Brian, over to you, sir. Hey, great. Thanks, Bruce, and thanks, Ryan. I think that was a great talk. Look, I just want to go through a couple of things that I think from a GP's perspective that I'll be focused on in clinical practice just as we distill this all out. Um, I think the situation in New Zealand, um, type 2 diabetes is a community, community medical issue with specialist backup. It's not um, specialist-driven. It needs to be – I think GPs, general practice, need to take the lead – with specialist support. Look, we've got 220,000 New Zealanders living with type two diabetes in New Zealand and the numbers are growing. It's a major, major problem. I actually believe it's a tsunami that's actually capable of overwhelming the New Zealand health system, the way things are actually traveling. So the introduction of MPEG Lefloson, I think is a big, big step forward um, for us. Now, why is it important in type two diabetes in New Zealand? Well, this was touched on by Ryan, but I just wanna highlight this, okay? Maori and Pacifica in particular, Let's face it, they have three to five times the rate of diabetes as European. Generally progressed to renal failure can be, in some figures, up to 10 to 12 times the rate of Europeans, which is really, really important. Cardiovascular disease, 1.5 times the rate of Europeans. And often younger onset, and I think this is really, really important, at 10 to 15 years younger um, than European. And on average, we've got 20 years to complication. Um, so if you look at all the diabetes across the world, if you're 65 and diagnosed, you're 85 by the time you have your big complication. If you're in your 20s or 30s, and a lot of patients I'm now seeing in East Pororua, where I work, have been diagnosed in their 20s, they're 40 to 50 before they have their major complications. And that is a major, major inequity. And I think that is actually very, very important. So I think this new medication gives a chance for actually more assertive treatment. And Ryan tapped into the big, big problem we've got in New Zealand, that's clinical inertia. And I think especially with these high-risk patients who may be younger in age, 
and have these greater risk of complication, we actually need to be more assertive and titrating medication and actively um, actively trying to intervene um, because complication is down the track because diabetes or type 2 diabetes is actually progressive. So where we've been, well, look, at, we all know we've been to metformin plus sulfonylurea plus insulin, and that's where we've been. There's been a limited role for bioglitazones and arcabose. Um, glycemic control has been, been a big, big focus with the use of these medications. And to be frank, New Zealand's really fallen five plus years behind the rest of the Western world. The really interesting thing about it, medications like empagliflozin, they've been available for quite a few years uh, across the ditch in, in, in Australia. Um, so they've been used widely in the Western world for a number of years. And New Zealand's actually in a catch up mode here, I think, with these medications. So remember, it's for type 2 only, not type 1. And I think that's really, really important. So it's a paradigm shift, isn't it? It stops glucose reabsorption, as Ryan tapped into. You pee out the sugar. That's the critical thing. It, it, you, you pee it out. It doesn't get reabsorbed into the body. And that's how it lowers the overall um, sugar in the body. We need to think wider than glycemic control because we've been very, very fixed on glycemic control um, using other medications for blood pressure and, and glucose. But a medication like empagliflozin actually gives us, we need to start to think about glycemic control plus renal protection plus cardiovascular protection with possible weight reduction of up to two kilos and blood pressure reduction of two to four milligrams with one medication. So, so I think we need to think wider than pure glycemic control, and we need to shift the way we're thinking about um, the treatment of diabetes. Again, as Ryan tapped into 10 to 25 milligrams once a day, titrating from 10 milligrams um, by itself or in combination, so that pill burden can be reduced. And it's additive. So you can add it to metformin, you can add it to metformin plus glyptins. You can add it to metformin plus glyptins plus sulfonylureas. You can add it to metformin plus glyptins plus insulin. You can actually add it anywhere in the diabetic journey. And I think that's a really, really important point. And it's not subtractive, it's additive. And that's that's something we, we again, need to focus on. Again, urinary UTI symptoms, as was tapped into, and this very rare glycemic ketoacidosis, um, we need to watch for dehydration and watch for intercurrent illness, things like vomiting, diarrhea, or you know, spiking temperatures, things like that. We need to think about stopping the medication, and as Ryan quite rightly pointed out, um, testing for, for ketones. But very, very rare, a lot of experience in Australia, very few cases um, over there. So we need to put that in perspective. The benefits outweigh the, the side effects as long as we're, we're, we're careful with this. So what are the trigger points for empagliflozin? And again, it comes from our special authority, but we need to be thinking about it as HbA1c is above 53. And we need to be thinking about it with, I think, with microalbinuria in particular. And, you know, younger patients, I'm surprised the number of younger patients we diagnose, diagnose with, with type 2 diabetes who present with microalbinuria at the type of uh, diagnosis. High cardiovascular risk greater than 15%, previous cardiovascular event, such as heart failure, MI, younger onset. And I think that talks to the length of time that diabetes is with us and the potential for complications 20 years down the track. We want to delay those complications. And obviously Maori and Pacific because of that inequity that exists. Again, with or without insulin, additive to metform, plus or minus glyptins or sulfonylurea. So I'm just going to present three quick cases. These are patients in my practice where I'd consider using it, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So this is um, Patricia. She's 46, uh, Philippines, type 2 diabetes, Filipino, diagnosed in 2015. Weight 77 kilos. She's got hypertension, asthma. She does have microalbinuria and EGFR in 90. Diltazion, diltazim, salazapril, statin, simbicort, and she's on galvumet at this point. Most recent, recent HbA when C is 69. Where to next? Um, basically, I'd consider introducing empagliflozin at 10 milligrams. Um, remember, glycemic control plus renal protection plus CV protection. And I'm really interested in the fact that she has hypertension and she has microalbinuria. Um, possible UTI, um, urine, watch out for dehydration with intermittent, um, um, intermittent um, illness, and obviously titration to 25 milligrams over a three-month period. Um, and 
So case two is Tusi, another patient of mine, 40-year-old Pacific male, type 2 diabetes. He was diagnosed in 2012. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia, past MI at a very young age, microalbuminuria, EGFR of 75. Again, he's on an ACE, statin, aspirin, metoprolol, metformin, and glycoside, and his most recent HbA1c is 74. Um, he's, 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 he's big. Again, I would consider empagliflozin in this type of situation, and I'd definitely consider combining it with metformin to simplify the regime. Um, so again, remember it's additive to the other medications that are there. Glycemic control plus renal protection plus cardiovascular protection is incredibly important. Again, UTIs, urinary symptoms, dehydration, intermittent illness are things I'll be thinking about. And we're combining the empagliflozin with metformin to simplify the regime. The final one. Um, okay, so this is James. And again, he's a patient of mine. He's 48 years old. He's a Maori male, type 2 diabetes, diagnosed in 2009. Now he's 140 kilos. Um, he's on basal insulin, 60 units nocte, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, microalbuminuria an episode of CC, congestive cardiac failure just prior to Christmas and he was admitted to hospital, EGFR of 55. Um, he's on vildagliptin, metformin, ACE, statin, aspirin, plus the insulin. Um, and his daily, sorry, his daily doctrinal basal insulin is about 100 units and he's on short acting 50 units TDS. So he's actually pretty insulin resistant because of his weight, which is problematic. Um, and his most recent HbA1c is 80, despite, um, he's, he's been trying quite hard with this, but it's, 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 it's been difficult. So again, I would consider empagliflozin with him at 10 milligrams, titrating to 25 milligrams. I remember it's additive to the insulin and the galvumet, but you may need to think about reduction of the insulin in this situation um, because of the potential for hyperglycemia because of, of, of the insulin. Um, remember, glycemic control plus renal protection plus CV protection is why we're thinking about this. Again, the urinary symptoms are important, intermittent illness and the reduction of the insulin. And the thing I'll um, just mention here that mid-year, we're going to have um, the GELP1 agonist come on board, which is a weekly injection, which we'll need to talk about, glutide. It's got a big name. Um, its advantage is potentially a weekly injection that can, and, and possibly a, a third of people, produce up to 10% weight loss. I've actually talked to uh, James about potentially switching to that when it becomes available for a period of time to see if we can achieve some additional weight loss and maybe switching back. But we're just going to have a look at that. So again, with the Pharmac criteria, we can't use both together, although that is done quite commonly overseas. We need to switch between them. And I think a switch here could be quite justified because of his weight issues, which could benefit his, his, um, overall, his overall sugar control if we could lose some weight. Um, so it'd be worth considering that down the track for a period of time. So um, that's all I really want to say about it at this point, just having thought about it. And um, back over to you, Bruce, for um, discussion. Oh, you're, you're on mute, mute, Bruce. A monstrous amount of questions. Um, that we'll, we'll, we'll rip through them if we can. Um, are the, um, the question about genital urine infections, are they dose-related? And if you're getting, if they you're at the 25, would you drop them down to the 10? I, I'm happy to make a couple of comments and let Ryan comment from my perception of this, Ryan, and, and to tell me if I'm wrong. Um, the, the, the genital urinary stuff, especially the thrush and around the perianal anus, uh, around the perianal region or, um, or around the foreskin is that is due to actually glucose on the skin, that you're peeing out glucose and that causes a lot of thrush issues that you get. And as your sugar comes down, that problem problem um, tends to resolve a little bit. I don't know about whether whether it's common practice to maybe start with a, a, a clotrimazole cream or something in the initial initial phase, or, or or twice daily recommending twice daily cleaning or something like that around the area to, to prevent problems with with thrush in particular. Yeah, I agree, Brian. You can be prepared, I guess, if, if these infections arise. Um, I will say generally if they're going to occur, they occur when you start on the 10 milligrams daily. And so if they're already on the 25, then um, it could be reasonable to reduce down to 10. Um, we even stop for a while if they're significant and then reintroduce um, back at 10 once they're, once they're um, gone. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would definitely wouldn't start. I would definitely want to increase someone from 10 to 25 if they have 
ongoing problems with recurrent infections. Um, are the renal and cardiovascular benefits dose related? For example, if the HbA1c is well controlled, would you uh, increase to a target, or would you um, only increase if requiring better glycemic control? I, I would base it primarily on glycemic control. So I'll, I'll leave it at 10 milligrams a day. And this, the only caveat would be, unless you wanted to get someone off insulin and soften their ears. Um, because the whole idea, if possible, is to limit the use of insulin and soften. I saw a couple of questions come up about that. Um, is to limit the use of insulin and soften ears if you can. So you want to keep them to, if you can um, do that, then that may be beneficial in that scenario. I think you answered this, but is there also a risk of ketoacidosis with normal glucose levels? Yeah, know? there is. I guess this, this is the one to one of the areas to watch out for. Um, probably the other one is, is pregnancy or significant exercise. Um, but so definitely, so glucose levels may be completely plumb normal and they may still have ketoacidosis. So don't base testing of ketones on glucose levels, base it on the patient's condition. Right. Um, so you, and you mentioned they lower blood pressure. Is that um, by themselves alone, is it? Yeah, it is. Um, so you will find, um, I know a few cardiologists across the country using it off-label in terms of just using it in heart failure for patients without diabetes. Um, but the reductions in blood pressure alone with empagliflozin are quite modest. I'm only talking about, you know, probably on average two, two to four millimetres of mercury. So I noticed in your case you dropped the philodipine. What was the concern there? I guess mainly that her baseline blood pressure was relatively tight, you could argue, at 112, I think, for memory yeah. systolic. And you really want to, you know that potentially you're going to drop it further and you want to maintain your ACE, um, ACE inhibitor or ARB. So you want, you want to keep that going if you can. So other agents such as philodipine won't really be adding any, any benefit. Yep. Uh, increased amputation rate in the lower extremity like was found in canagliflozin. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the initial studies for canagliflozin um, did show an increased risk, um, but that hasn't been shown in, um, I guess, um, phase four studies for canagliflozin or any of the other SGL2 inhibitors. So um, peripheral vascular disease should not be a contraindication to using these agents. Okay. Question here about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in Tresto or Jardians. My understanding is in Tresto only works for reduced ejection fraction. fraction. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think there's been any comparisons of those two, would there, Ryan? Oh, not yeah. to my knowledge, but I must admit I'm not a heart failure expert. Oh, there's actually a study going on at the moment with preserved ejection fraction with it overseas. Be nice if something works there, eh? Um, mm. At the Goodfellow Symposium on the Sunday morning, we've got... Um, Jerry Devlin, who will be talking about um, heart failure. Um, so do they reduce proteinuria with patients with diabetic nephropathy? Yeah, they do. Yep. Uh, your question about um, ACEs and ARBs not preventing renal problems. I, I was a bit puzzled by that. I thought the whole point of giving ACEs and ARBs. Did I get that wrong or...? Yeah, I guess it used to be the, or what we used to do is, you know, if you had a patient with diabetes and they're hypertensive, you started on an ACE inhibitor. That was the sort of your go-to. Um, but recent evidence shows they don't prevent diabetic renal disease at all. So those are it's only for those problems. that have existing microalbuminuria or low, low EGFR where they're going to be of benefit. So if you wanted to use another agent, you know, such as a calcium channel block or a thiazide, then that's absolutely fine. Okay. Um, this is a question. I think it's a, what advice should you give to a marathon type two diabetic? I guess that's someone who runs marathons who wants to use this. Stop two days prior to a marathon. Yeah, look, I they do run the risk of, of potentially with DKA. I mean, it's going to be very case dependent. It might just be the safest thing in terms of for a marathon if they're you know at risk just to stop it. If they're running yeah. a marathon, they'll be unlucky to have hyperglycemia. Okay. Do you recommend metformin to be given in pre-diabetes, HbA1c greater than 45? Yeah, I, I mean, I do. I'll be honest, there's, there's good evidence that metformin delays the progression to type 2 diabetes and still reduces cardiovascular mortality in this group. Um, one thing I will say, one thing you have to realise is that worldwide, diabetes is HbA1c over 48, and we've still got the cutoff of 50 in New Zealand, which is, yeah, we talk about that later. Yeah, okay. Um, Special authority says diabetes onset as a young adult. What is the definition of this? I'm young at 50. Yeah. Well, it, it is, I mean, it's, it's open wording, but Pharmac in a supporting document have said that they consider less than 25 years of age. 
I think it'd be very reasonable though if you've got a patient that you know thirty, you know early thirties, that still counts as a as, as a young adult. Uh, would you stop a sulfonylurea to start a um, SGLT two inhibitor? I would if they're at risk of hypoglycemia. Um, so they're, they're the ones that you know the HB on C less than sixty four. Because it'd be great if you can get them off their sulfonylurea. That's great. Um, can it still be self-funded for type one? I would, my understanding would be no. Not uh, you can. Uh, also, as a special, you can self-fund, um, but I would be very, very cautious, um, just because of the risk of DKA. So I only personally I only have a handful of patients with type one diabetes on an SGL two inhibitor. Um, it is off-label use, so it's for people to be aware. What would you be using that for? Would that be to control? So that, you still, you still, you still um, I guess, improve renal outcomes and, and oh, okay. those with type one diabetes. But I would not be encouraging anyone in primary care to go off-label without discussing with secondary care. Um, how much is Jardians per month if they choose to sell? I think it's r- roughly about ninety dollars. Uh, I will say it's very pharmacy dependent in terms of the markup. So I encourage patients to shop around and the online pharmacies such as Zoom and, and Pharmacy Direct often do have cheaper prices, but I just en- encourage patients to shop around in their region. Um, the question is, any evidence this drug helps with diastolic heart failure? Um, meaning preserved ejection uh, fraction, I presume. Yeah, there is um, for for that, and that's mainly related, I guess, in terms of the, the fluid state. Right, okay. Um, what's the equivalent dose of uh, embigoflozacin in changing from dabagliflozacin? Yeah, they do recommend, dabagliflozacin's only got one dose at 10 milligrams daily, and they do recommend going just back back to 10 milligrams daily of embigoflozacin. So just like, like for like. What are they? Uh, a lot of patients are fasting two days a week, the five and two. Can they use um, uh, Jardians if they're just going to stop it on those days? Or just stop it on those days? Yeah, that, that, would, be re- that would be reasonable. Uh, it does come into your, I, I, I guess there's no blanket rule, and you will have to be careful. But if you've got a patient which you know is at risk of DKA, and, and by default you have to be relatively insulin deficient to, have, to get DKA, so if you've got somebody which is on insulin and on a low-carbohydrate diet, I'd probably steer clear of those. Um, but if you've got uh, – otherwise, you, you, you'll probably get away with it, but you just want to be careful. Why is the early onset of type 2 diabetes a qualifying criteria if no evidence of benefit in primary prevention? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, and that's where I guess it comes back to the – I guess – what's best clinical practice. Um, I will say by, just with the nature of a cardiovascular risk character calculator as I touched on, pretty much you, your cardiovascular risk isn't going to get above 15% if you're below you know, 35, 40. It's virtually impossible to get it high. Uh, and most of these patients already have, um, as Brian mentioned, microalbuminuria. Um, that's generally the, the most common thing, but you, you definitely could argue. Um, one thing it does allow though, um, which is great, is that it allows best practice in terms of using them as a second-line agent in those that are overweight, which by default will indirectly reduce your risk of um, diabetic complications. Um, so they are a high-risk group. Do you still use ARBs in these patients or just evidence for ACEs? Oh, no, but both, both, both are fine, sorry. It's either or, but not, not in combination. No, I mean, I must admit I've gone over to ARBs because I got sick of all the coughing. Yeah. Uh, it's about 20% in my hands, I have to say. And particularly about, when, I guess, the combination with thiazides became problematic, get hold of. Lots of people used started off in ARBs. And e- either or is fine. Yep. Yep. Remember, you see lots of coughs on ACEs, Brian? Uh, yeah, I see a few. Um, but yeah, either using ARB or an ACE. I mean, yeah, if you swap it over, it's pretty good. But I, I think the main thing is to be on one or the other if there's any renal dysfunction. No, they're all fully funded, but it doesn't make much yeah. difference. So, no. so um, the old days are gone. Uh, does this new, new medication have an effect on the dawn phenomenon? I'm not sure what the dawn phenomenon is. Oh, I guess dawn phenomena is a rise in glucose levels, um, I guess, early in the morning due to um, like primary cortisol and growth hormone testosterone. Um, that's a good question. I don't... Um, 
I don't know of any direct effect. I mean, it's still helping with, um, I guess, lowering glucose levels. But I don't know of any specific effects on the dawn. It is le much less, you're much less likely to have a significant dawn form on type 2 diabetes. But I, it would be beneficial, but I, don't, I doubt it's going to fix it, the complete dawn form. Um, can you go straight to 25 milligrams daily? Oh, it's, I'd always start on 10. Yep. Okay. Um, is it possible to share your sick day printout for patients or is that from the... Yeah, it's good. Oh, one thing I did talk to, um, I will be talking to Bowring about, I briefly spoke to Neil Jarvis, who's head of Bowringer here, about changing our sick day management. Um, I will say one thing we're trying to do as NZSSD is coming out with a standard sick day management plan um, for everybody with diabetes in the country, um, regardless of what medication you're on. So you can give that advice to patients. Um at the moment, it's it's just um, giving that advice directly to patients. Um, and the main one is if they have nausea, vomiting, or abdo pain, to get the ketone levels checked, regardless of what their glucose levels are. Do people still use urine keto? No, I understand that they're no longer available. Um, so it's, it's, it's a blood ketone sticks, our uh, meters. Okay. Okay. Any idea how many practices have got that for the blood ketones? I would envision most patients would have, uh, most practices would have. And the ability yep. to measure capillary ketones, point of care ketones. Okay. Um, so, what it miss, with Mrs. T, what is the advantage of continuing the glipizide? Oh, that was basically to try and achieve glycemic control. That was yep. the only thing. Um, we did, did half the dose, um, but in the long run, so you managed to increase the empagliflozin up to 25 milligrams a day. So, your maximum dose empagliflozin, and you're able to get her off the sulfonaria. That would be the ideal. Thing, but given she's on so much insulin, I doubt that would happen. And you want to get them off the sulfonylurea because there's no cardiovascular benefit, is that right? Exactly. So when you, you always think about, as Brian touched on, cardiovascular and, and renal benefits um, and thinking about what agents are going to use which are going to provide that. Um, we briefly touched on when gelaglutide comes out, self-funding, um, or either empagliflozin or gelaglutide. If you think realistically, gelaglutide is probably going to cost several hundred dollars. I haven't seen a price yet, um, but it's likely to cost probably at least four or five hundred dollars a month, whereas empagliflozin costs ninety dollars a month. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine I'll be encouraging patients to self-fund yep. um, the SGL turn of it if, if, they, if they can. Uh, why not start Mr. T on Galvimet first off? Oh, Mr. Mr. T, um, that would be very reasonable. Yeah, it'd be a, it's, a, it's a good answer. Um, and that would be, to be honest, that's, that's what I'd do in, um, in practice. Um, the only reason, I guess you could argue, is I also started him on empagliflozin as well, um, or was going to, even though I may not put it in the case. So that, but that, that, that's, um, if you've got a patient which is, for example, has an HbA1c over 64 that you meet for the first time, I think it's very reasonable to start them on Galvimet straight off. Okay, just a question about urinary ketones there, but you've answered that, haven't you? Um, uh, I thought DKA was only in type 1 diabetics. Um, no, di di type 2, um, DKA can occur in any form of diabetes. Um, it typically only happens in end-stage type 2 diabetes. So right. one thing to realise, when most patients get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, they've already lost 50% of their beta cells, mm -hmm. and those beta cells will continue to die pretty much over the next 10 to 15 years. So most patients with type 2 diabetes, which if they get to end-stage, will be at risk of DKA. Yeah, and I, and I guess the trap is they may turn into a type one on your watch sort of thing. Well, I uh, guess, uh, yeah, I guess technically speaking that they, they won't have type one diabetes, but they are for all wanton purposes a type one, um, yeah. just with that, their risk of DKA. Um, okay, I think you answered that one. Uh, BP 150.90 on philodipine, 10 milligrams daily, add SGLT2 inhibitor, BP still similar, do you add ACE inhibitor? Um, GEGFR at 50 or at 55. Yeah, I, I definitely would. Ideally, you'd have them on ACE inhibitor before the flotopine. Um, I, I would be starting an ACE inhibitor up. I'll, I'll be, um, I mean, I'm, I guess one of my bugbears is clinical inertia. I'll be honest, when I see patients, I often start, I mean, you may call it gung ho, but multiple agents at once, um, particularly in, in private. If you know that someone, often I see patients, for example, with an HPNC of 85. And you know that um, I'm just on metformin alone, and you know you're not going to get them to target 
um, just by one agent. So I often start empagliflozin, um, you know, liraglutide or exenatide, a GLP-1 agonist, and even think about other, other therapies. And for that patient um, that we just described in that question, you know their baseline blood pressure is 160 systolic. They're not going to go hypotensive adding empagliflozin. So I'd actually probably start an ACE inhibitor and empagliflozin at the same time. There's nothing wrong with being cautious, um, but I think if you know that you've got a patient which is very low risk, um, particularly if they have trouble coming back to the practice, um, in terms of, say, low risk of hypotension, there's nothing wrong with actually being uh, aggressive when you've got the patient there. Uh, you mentioned ACE before philodipine. Do you have a thing about philodipine? Oh, no, no. It's just that we know that if you've got a, if you've got a patient with diabetes and renal disease, mm. we know that um, an ACE inhibitor ARB um, will slow down the progression of renal disease up and above the effect of blood pressure. Okay. So yeah. it's always for anyone with diabetes and renal disease, you want an ACE inhibitor and ARB. And if they've got type 2 diabetes, ideally empagliflozin as well. I've wow. got nothing, nothing against philodipine, um, but it's just came back to your, came back to your, your basics yeah. and your comorbidities. But so I find with the 10 milligrams, there's just such an enormous number of swollen ankles. Oh, there are. Uh, yeah. oh, the number um, of patients I've seen start on philodipine and then freezamide. I, I, spend this, I spend the summer stopping philodipine in my clinic yep. when I cover over the summer, the big fat feet. Uh, risk of pelvic floor complications in male patients with CA prostate treated with radiotherapy? Any oh, I, I must admit, I've, I, I couldn't give any accurate complications. I mean, they may have a slightly increased risk of... Um, UTI and balantitis, but I wouldn't expect it to necessarily convert to pelvic floor um, dysfunction. Um, uh, can you, could you mention that looking out for double dosing and metformin of patients on government? Yeah, that, that, yeah that, that's a good point. Um, so I I haven't prescribed, oh, I've prescribed a few patients with Jardimet, but if a patient's on Galvimet, I haven't bothered to switch into Jardimet, for example. Um, I've just started Jardiance or empagliflozin. Um, so you do want to be looking at your, your total metformin dose um, per day. Um, how quick, slow do you increase metformin? Um, Two fifty milligrams every three days, or what's yeah, the... I, th I think that would be reasonable. Sometimes I ramp it up, ramp up quite fit, quite quickly. Um, but even over, I'll get them up to a gram twice a day, for example, over, over a month. A question about re uh, creatinine renal monitoring. Um, every two weeks after starting in Plozen? Yeah, it's an, another good question. I don't. Um, I think it's an important thing to monitor. You, it would go by your risk. You want to, um, in someone that's lower, I'll just. I think wait until the next review is fine. But if you've got someone that's high risk, and I'd say high risk is if they're on elderly um, or on a lot of ACE inhibitor ARBs and diuretics, you may want to be measuring it um, earlier. I had an issue the other day with our diabetes nurse Tavika. Um, we had a patient, EGFR was 29, and we did a calculation using his Cockroft gold. He was 55. Yeah. And 45 was his creatinine clearance. Because presumably you'd go on his creatinine clearance. Yeah, uh, yeah. creatinine clearance is, is, is better. But I will say, in, in the, it won't be that far away that we'll know that SGL alternatives are safer, are safe in those with a low EGFR. But at yeah. present, we don't. So the advice is to not use it. Yeah, that's because I guess the study set that as the limit, wouldn't it? Yeah, they? it is. Yep. So it's, it's an absence of evidence rather than evidence. That's correct. And that, that evidence is coming out showing there's still, it won't really lower glucose levels, but it will have um, benefits in renal and cardiovascular disease. But, but how many times, Bruce, do you see if the, the, the EGFR is slightly low like that and you get them hydrated a bit and it just pops up again quite considerably sometimes? Oh, good point. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's better than doing a 24-hour urine, which I did mm, once. I always just get them to repeat it and just get them to drink a bit of fluid before I do it. Yeah, that's, that's a good, good, good tip. Um, Mrs. T, really an advantage in keeping her on sulfonylurea with so many meds in her cocktail already? No, I mean, I when you've got something that's really insulin efficient, I mean, sulfonylurea aren't going to do much. I slot them relatively early, um, but the I think the one trap you don't want to fall into is when you've got someone above target, and then you start cutting medications out without adding in basically other ones to um, lower the, get them to target. So I agree about the website address. I think that was the NZ SSD. It's on the chat box, um, Adrian. So um, uh, yeah, so that, that's there. 
Um, would you consider withholding SGLT2 in acute kidney injury? Definitely, I would. Um, I'd, to be honest, I'd stop at any illness. So in our inpatients, um, basically, I stop stop everything. Um, so and I'd, I'd be given that advice, and it is in um, you can make it quite clear in the patient information that you give. Um, basically, if you're unwell for any cause, to stop, stop the SGLT2 inhibitor temporarily. Yep. Why not combine ACE and ARB and diabetic renal disease? Uh, that's basically shown that the stage had no additional benefit, um, but increased risk of complications. Okay, so what medications with EGFR less than 30? Um, you've got um, basically low-dose metformin if the EGFR is between 15 to 30. You've got vildagliptin, 50 milligrams once a day, and unfortunately the only other option is insulin. Yeah. So it's a really common, uh, unfortunately common situation to, um, to be in. Um, can you use empagliflozin in recurrent UTI patients? Um, you can. Um, I'll be cautious, um, but um, there is evidence that shows that it doesn't overly increase the frequency, but I'll just be very, I would be cautious in that group. I was just going to mention not to use uh, nitrofurantoin as a preventive. Um, there's about 10 ACC claims from the last few years on uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Oh. From, um, yeah, so... Any other way of preventing, if someone got a lot of UTIs, anything, any other suggestions for that? Oh, I mean, I, I'd be reluctant to have them on long-term antibiotics just so I could have an SGL2 inhibitor. Yeah. Um, or other, other, uh, yeah, if, if, you know, if you've got a patient that's got adverse effects, um, I'll be looking at stopping it. And I will say in these groups, um, a GLP-1 agonist will also provide significant benefit in terms of reducing cardiovascular and renal disease. So they'll be the patients um, which we think, hey, they'll be the perfect ones to switch to gelaglutide. Um, a question about linagliptin. Um, is that becoming available in New Zealand? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, when Pharmac just reviewed their latest round, it's staying with um, vertigliptin as the only funded um, yeah. medication. There is also sexagliptin and citagliptin you can self-fund, um, but vertigliptin is only funded DPP-4 inhibitor at the moment. Um, why uh, why can't Mrs T stop her furosemide? Does she have CHF too? I think you did stop. Oh, her. I could do, look. I just made that case up. An example of just thinking about if on diuretics, think about cutting back if needs be. Yeah. I mean, if she was grossly overloaded in terms of fluid wise, I wouldn't be cutting back her diuretic. Mm -hmm. Just like if she had a blood pressure of say one, you know, one fifty above one fifty millimeters of mercury systolic, I wouldn't be bothering cutting back antihypertensives either. Uh, it's just it's just thinking about. Um, you know, how, how can I prevent ad, the adverse effects from, from happening? Uh, for, for your test patient, why not consider the combined SGLT2 inhibitor metformin formula, formulation early on? That's true. I think from memory, she was on galbumet. I may be wrong. Oh, she wasn't, actually. Um, so you, you, could, you could either consider that early on. That's absolutely fine. Um, yeah. Or if they're on galbumet, you might choose to leave them on that. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with starting Jardimet instead of Jardians. Absolutely nothing wrong. Um, is trans the transient reduction in EGFR when starting SGLT2 inhibitors, what percent reduction is acceptable? I usually accept up to 15% reduction in EGFR when first starting ACE. Yeah, I think that, that's very reasonable. I sometimes go a little bit more, 20-25%, um, but the main thing is, is watching it and making sure it's not um, permanent or progressive. Yeah, the, um, yeah, okay. Why has New Zealand fallen five years behind? Well, <laughs> I, I think, I think oh, it's I just have a <laughs> yeah, Brian was previously. Yeah, I, I yeah. think it comes down to simple down the cost. If you think we've got oh. 350,000 New Zealanders with type 2 diabetes, and every one of them got prescribed the medication. Um, Oh, look, I, I think, think you know, yeah, 250000 with, with with the amount that could go on this, it's very hard to control cost in a cap system. So, yeah, it's as simple as that. Hmm. Everyone happy to pay more taxes? That might help. Yeah. Let's pay more taxes. Um, uh, how much better is uh, uh, Jardians than Vildagliptin? And what would you choose? What would make you choose one over the other? Yep, that's a good, good question. So you're probably going to get uh, more glucose lowering effect with Jardians and Vildagliptin. Um, for, for example, the mean reduction HbA1c of Vildagliptin is about five millimole per mole. 
because you might get slightly more about you know 10 millimole per mile with with right. Jardians. The other thing is vilodiplin is what weight neutral, and it has no benefits um, on cardiovascular disease or renal disease up and above glycemic control, or to date. Um, the evidence, but, but isn't it the one medication that's shown a yeah, delay in progression? It, to it does delay the need yeah. for insulin therapy. So yeah. it's still it's still a good medication. It's mm, still a mm, mm. a good go to second line agent. But I would say there was no restrictions on funding whatsoever. I would go to empagliflozin after metformin. Well, did you think the standard is going to end up being metformin, empagliflozin, and glyptin, then insulin? That's that's essentially where we're going to yep. end up. Yeah, yep. I think so. Um, yep. is like, a, like a glyptin. poor cousin of yep. the GLP-1 agonist so mm. Mm. I, I think we'll find GLP-1 agonist comes in there um, as well but vildagliptin still I mean it's probably still a good agent to use in the elderly or those of um, you know EGFR less than 30 they're mm. a group which is really going to benefit or if they've got no evidence of diabetic um, renal disease or um, cardiovascular disease and they're normal weight um, there's no real benefit for SGL2 inhibitor over Vilagliptin in that group either. So there's still a large group of patients where vilagliptin will still be the preferred second line agent. And I think the other important point is just to reinforce that if you're starting the empirical flows and not to stop the vilagliptin. Yeah, exactly. Add, add yeah, keep, keep it yeah. going. Keep it going. Yep. And is it contraindicated with those with deranged but relatively stable liver function tests due to liver severe fatty liver disease? No, there's no um, there's no dose requirements in hepatic impairment. Um, I wouldn't be using it in those with marked, uh, I guess, hepatic um, decompensation, but in all other patients I'd use. In fact, um, fatty liver disease improves. Um, obviously, if you improve glycemic control, you improve fatty liver disease. Wow. Um, it's a bit hard. The hardest one's vertigliptin. So now you, you know, if, if the AL, AL2, AST is above two and a half times the upper limit of normal, it's not recommended for use. Um, I'd be honest, I still use it if the patient's got fatty liver disease, but I know that it's going to get, get better. Um, but you're just going to be a, a little bit more, more cautious there. Um, the other thing I want to, I guess the other take home point is that it's fine to use all the agents together. Um, but, but it's still, if you know, they're not going to cause hypos and metformin, vitagliptin, empagliflozin and pioglitazone together. I've got you know a few patients in all those four. They don't have hypos. They don't need to check their glucose levels. And that's a very well. important take-home message as we talk about, Ryan. I like uh, it. So you're, um, you're, not, you're doing the heavy lifting and you're still not getting you know, hypos. So I think we can breathe somewhat easily. Um, we worry about it, but uh, it, may be, uh, it may be vanishingly rare. Yeah, I, I, and that's why, you know, these why the, one reason why these agents are, are so great and why, why they come in early. What are the primary symptoms presentation for you guys seeing that? Ketoacidosis, like what should we watch out? For? I guess it'll still be the nausea, um, vomiting, abdo pain. Um, I mean, you may see them breathing fast or smell ketones, um, but generally patients always have, and, and they'll be feeling like feeling unwell. Um, but it's, it's those symptoms in particular which I'd have a, um, be checking for ketones in. Yeah. Uh, question here that you might be able to answer, Brian, may, may take you all night though. What exactly are the inequity issues that exist for Mari and PDI? Um, oh, well, I mean, you just have to look at the stats. I mean, you know, um, the end result is, is is the differences we're seeing in A, the diagnosis, you know, this left shift, it's called, into to younger onset, um, and B, the outcome data, uh, especially things like renal. Renal progression is, is, is horrendous. I mean, 50. You know, if, if you go to any renal dialysis ward in New Zealand now, it's for Lamari and Pacific, and 54% of that is driven by diabetes. So that stat, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the really important stats. This, this 12 times it's been talked about, or 10 to 12 times, and it varies depending on who you talk to, um, that progression is, is there. And what's that due to? Um, whether it's poor control, or it's lifestyle poverty, a whole lot of things, um, genetics, it's a combination of things. But the fact of the matter is, which is one of the reasons um, Pharmac put Maori and Pacific into the uh, into the criteria, is because of, of the the huge disparity that actually exists. Uh, uh, doc here with a patient includes many patients from Indian descent with hard to manage type two diabetes, and I guess the thing there is Indian men have the highest rate of cardiovascular disease in New Zealand. Yep, so it's, a, it's a new inequity we we found in some gout work. They had some of the poorest control, interestingly. Um, so they're they're a, a growing group, I think. 
Yeah, and, and there'll be another group which really benefit from these medications. Yeah. Um, um, question about supply of um, these medications. Are we going to have enough? Yeah. yeah well, there, 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 right. there, so, right. I, I spoke to Farmic today about this, and they said there's, there's plenty of supply. There's a huge amount in the country, and it's, it's the supply chains are very good. Yep. Oh, that's good. Um, uh, can they cause phimosis? Um, and will that and uh, what is it significant? Will that lead to peri perineal necrosis? I guess the only um, if they don't have uh, infections, I can't see how they'd cause phimosis. Um, if they are get recurrent balantitis, for example, that that may um, obviously contribute towards that. And Any risk factors for the perineal necrosis? I mean, it sounds pretty damn scary. No, um, not not. I mean, these, these, this is rare. Yeah. This is one of those points that FDA added just because a, a few case reports came up. I doubt we'll see any in New Zealand, but that possibility is there. And it's just being um, you know, aware. If you've, it's one, I, I, still tell, I do tell patients that you know, if you have severe pain around the, the genital area um, to you know, present acutely, um, mm -hmm. just to have it excluded. Um, but if one of us sees it, I think we'll be... Be amazing. Well, I think that old thing, if the patient's got pain out of keeping with what yep. you're expecting, you have to think the worst, you know. Yeah, it is. Like, just like any necrotizing infection. Yeah, yeah. Mm. ship them out. Um, uh, it can be used as met mono monotherapy if metformin's not tolerated. Yep. Yep. Um, Brian, if someone has poor control, e.g., 70 and only on metformin in the Marine Pacific and more than three months, would you add vildagliptin or? Jardians first, assuming in date being on both, um, in which case um, would you use a combination with metformin or, and which as a standalone? Oh, look, 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 you'd be moving to three, three agents at some point, depending on what the HPAC response was. I'd use a combination because you want to reduce the pill burden. So, yeah, probably probably impagla flows and then, then add in, in a vildagliptin as you need to. Um, you could you quite go the other way, but if there's any microalbuminuria or anything like that, I'm definitely going for, for impact of flows in first. Yep. To be honest, um, um, Bruce, I'll probably start both at the same time. Hmm. You, you know yep. you're not going to get to target on yep. on one agent alone, and you know you're not going to cause hypos. So I'll yep. just, that's the time I'll go for both. Yep. 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 Um, can you talk a bit about GLP-1? We'll fit into pathways so that we don't make too many changes in a short time that might risk losing patient confidence. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so, G oh, so briefly, GLP-1 agonists, and we're going to have gelaglutide funded, um, which would be a once-weekly subcut injection, very similar to insulin And they also reduce cardiovascular and renal disease up and above glycemic control and probably lead to greater weight loss and, um, and glycemic control than SGLT inhibitors, but they have no benefit um, for heart failure. So if you had patients with heart failure, you're going to be an SGL2 inhibitor would be a preferred agent. For others, there's no clear cut. Um, you're probably still going to be pushed. The renal benefit for SGL2 inhibitors is probably greater. So if you've got renal disease or heart failure, you'll go for an SGL2 inhibitor. If they're very, um, I guess, overweight or obese, or they've got cerebrovascular disease, you might be pushed more towards a GLP-1 agonist. Um, now, in Herf and Pharmac, it's only going to be the one special authority for both of them. So there's nothing wrong with actually switching patients over from embiclofosin to gelaglutide. And rather than, to be honest, rather than just waiting a few months and not doing anything, I think patients are generally better off starting embiclofosin now if there's no contraindications, mm -hmm. and then switch them over later down the line um, if, if you choose to do that. Um, they They... And I will say they often are a good alternative to basal insulin. And I think it would be worth having another symposium later in the year um, when gelagotide is available to talk about, really to talk about that in more detail. Well, in some ways it's nice that there's a bit of a gap in them coming out because I well remember the COPD drugs when three new ones came out. We, we all just couldn't get our heads around the names. Yeah, it, it, it gives us a chance to learn. Yeah, one, one at a time, please. Um, I don't know if I get this question, but to be eligible, you mentioned cardiovascular risk needs to be greater than 15%. Is this the clinical 
calculated risk. Or calculated that, that, that's a calculated okay. risk. But we'll say any ischemic heart disease or any cardiovascular disease will count as also being eligible. And that yeah, includes... Thing plus, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and that includes basically any, any event you can think of, you know, right from TIA, um, any angina or, or previous stent, um, if, and familial hypercholesteremia as well. I know it's rare, but they also get in um, with or without cardiovascular risk calculation. Um, patient with a history of renal calculi in all other speaks could benefit from empagliflozin, or is it safe to start with or is it a contraindication? Oh, it, it's a precaution. Um, I must admit, I don't, I don't not know too much about this. I've started in patients with a previous history of renal calculi and they've been fine. I think you're just being aware of just that um, for those that have multiple recurrent, I think it's primarily related to the dehydration or anything else, um, that just be, be, be aware of it. Okay. If we need to decrease insulin, do we decrease the basal or the short-acting insulin or both? Um, you may find you need to decrease both, um, but generally most patients that I see are on far too much basal versus short-acting insulin. So you may just need to decrease the basal insulin. There's no... Um, perfect answer, but if you if you're worried, I'll decrease both. Um, okay, due to the side effect related to dehydration, would that mean that we would need to stop HGLT two inhibitors as our patients get older? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I don't think anyone knows the perfect answer to this. Uh, that's a really good question. But if you're worried about, I guess, them becoming frailer and increased risk, particularly polypharmacy, I, I would be thinking about stopping it. Particularly if, there's, if the benefit's becoming you know, a lot less, if you think about renal and cardiovascular disease at, at a very old age. Um, how often do you test serum ketones in asymptomatic patients on Jardians? Would you bother? Oh, I wouldn't bother. No, okay. Um, okay, if someone is female and childbearing age, would you still commence to ensure adequate contraception? Yeah, I want, I, you do have to have that talk about contraception. I mean, there is no data during pregnancies. So we don't know if it's safe or unsafe. Um, but often these patients are on ACE inhibitor and perhaps a statin as well. So you are thinking about contraception in these patients. And if they got pregnant, you'd stop them immediately? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Because of the absence of information. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so we've dealt with that. Um, if patient on insulin and 10 milligrams Jardians with good glycemic control, can the insulin be stopped? Yeah, it can be. If, if, they're, if they're to target, yes. Um, uh, and particularly we'll notice, and this will be probably more so with gelaglutide become available than um, Jardians, but both, both um, would be, have an opportunity of getting patients off insulin, particularly if they keep going with their lifestyle management, which would be absolutely fantastic. Specific guidelines for those of Indian ethnicity, given their diabetes risk and prevalence, similar to that of Pacifica. I mean, I think with I will say about um, I guess with all ethnicities, uh, but or in, in the New Zealand setting, there's no evidence that any of these medications are more or less effective based on ethnicity alone. But what we do know is obviously their risk of diabetic complications in Maori Pacific India are a lot higher. So they're the group that you're thinking about, hey, I really want to target the cardiovascular renal risk, and this is another string to the bow of that. So I don't think it's, you're not necessarily, um, you know, basing, your, your, it's no pharmacogenomic decision based on ethnicity, but you're basing it purely on cardiovascular and renal risk. Yeah, and some, one of the problems with, with of course, um, CVD risk in young people is by virtue of their age, it's not yep. that high. Um, so you have to sort of think outside the box a bit um, you know, if they're heading into trouble, you don't want them having their MI at 35 just because their CVD risk is 5 Exactly. Well, I guess we know that um, SGL2 inhibitors don't have any events of primary prevention, so that mm -hmm. sort of makes that decision a little bit easier. What I find hardest for that group is statin therapy. You know, is choosing, we, we know that their cardiovascular risk is higher, mm -hmm. um, and I, I always have that discussion with patients. But I think we know at, at the moment it's only once those that have established disease um, which will, will benefit. So, um, But most of those patients are also, I guess, overweight 
or obese. There's not many patients which unfortunately with type 2 diabetes at a young, young age which aren't. And they are be the patients which will also benefit. So that, that will govern your decision making. Yeah, but I, I do think we need to be thinking longer term here. There's 15, 20 years down the track yeah, and, yep. and intervention and not sitting back and waiting, which has been the traditional way, which is a inertia issue that you tapped into, that we need to be thinking more assertively yep. the younger the patient with the diagnosis. No, I totally agree. And it's also yeah. important to realise that type 2 diabetes is almost a different disease in young people. Mm. And as an mm. old, it's a lot more progressive. Yep. It's associated with complications a lot earlier. Yep. There's interesting data from counties, Manica from Wing Chen of the... Yep. The pre-diabetic and the young patient, they uh, the Pacific. Some of the Pacific people just go roaring off, you know, give them a year or two, and their and their diet, you know, they'll come in 47, 48, and then a year or two later they'll be, um, you know, fully diabetic and uh, heading in the wrong direction. I just come here from Alan Moffat to saying that the ACEs and ARBs delay the deterioration of existing renal disease, which I think is correct, isn't it? You've got to have existing renal disease. Yeah, but it's, yeah. I don't, it's important that people don't forget about ACE inhibitors and ARBs and statins and metformin. We know that these all, all benefit. So it's not, not forgetting their old traditional um, treatment. The benefit in heart failure is it reduced and preserved ejection fraction. Do we know that? Yeah, I, I, from, from memory it does. Um, and it also, heart failure is the only condition which I guess SGLT2 has been shown to prevent, so to speak, in terms of complications. So they, it actually prevents the development of heart failure as well. Any issues in jumping straight in with the BD fixed dose combination, metformin, EPEG, EPEG? Oh, no, no. If you start off with the five milligram dose and whatever combination of metformin you choose, that, that, that would be, if you use it in combination of metformin, start twice daily dosing. But the, the, the only problem is the metformin dose itself that it's fixed. Yeah, it is. You, you may want to start lower with a separate dose of metformin until you get yeah. to the 500. What, what is interesting, oh, this, is, this is just an anecdotal comment, is that all these medications in combination with metformin seem to be much better tolerated than metformin itself. Wow. Um, so mm. if you've got a patient which is intolerant of metformin, and I've done this for multiple, I know colleagues around the country have, we've switched them to galvimet, for example, which has been the, the available combination up until now, and they tolerate it well. So don't be afraid of, of trying that. Um, okay. Um, would you will you prefer switching to Jardians for a well-controlled diabetic on Galvimet? If they've got, um, di I forgot renal disease or cardiovascular disease, I, I definitely would. If they're overweight, I I'll probably try uh, as well. If but it's a well-controlled, nothing else. So. Um... Oh no! If, if they're well-controlled, no, I'll leave them on Galvimet. Yeah. And I would I wouldn't go stopping it the Galvimet either. Um, do you lose the SA for uh, Jardians if patient wants to self-fund dual glutide uh, uh, themselves? On no, top no, you just have to you, you, know, you just have to be on one of them. And yeah. I, I'd encourage mm. I'd encourage patients to be on special authority for glutide and self-fund the imiclofazin. Uh, yeah, um, is it contraindicated in the fasting month of Ramadan? Is it there's an issue? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's not fasting all day, is it? That's fine. No, it's not. If I mean, if they're still mm. getting enough carbohydrate intake, I'd, I'd probably continue continue on. Um, if uh, you're weighing up against the risk of, I guess, dehydration and, and, and low mm. carb intake. Um, but patients can also, with diabetes, particularly if they've got advanced, it's okay to opt out of Ramadan. Um, and so it's important to realize that patients have that option. Um, but it's something you obviously want to discuss with the patient. Okay, um, okay. Uh, which CVR calculator are the recommendations based on? I would hope it's the new ones, the new Rod Jackson equation. Uh, interesting, my CVD risk went from 12% to 6% on the new equation. So I, think, uh, yeah. I think there's quite a difference. You don't want to be using the old one no. uh, over overdoing it. And the, and, the, and the newer calculators have got the benefit of adding in ethnicity yeah. and um, family history as risk. So I would, I'll be going with updated data, but it's based on, strictly speaking, it's based on a validated calculator. Yep. But taking into account with the younger um, patient, there's that issue with five years. Sorry, what was that, Brian? 
So with the younger patient, you, there's also this this issue of the, the calculator is looking at the five years versus the, the longer term risk over 10 to 15 years and the decisions you start to make. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think you're right about that. A um, uh, question about reducing uric acid. Yeah, it does. Um, so that's one exciting benefit of SGL2 inhibitors. Now that hasn't, um, those stu studies in terms of the effect on gout underway, um, I understand to date there's no evidence that, well, that SGL2 inhibitors conclusively reduce gout, but there's very good evidence they reduce uric acid levels. So it's an exciting space to watch. And the other one is low sartan will reduce uric acid levels. So um, if you've got a lot of gout patients, that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, um, would you introduce vildagliptin now if starting medication and new type 2 with metformin first line? Yeah, I would. If the if HB1C is realistic, if it's above 64, I, I would. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is it best taken Mane or Nocte? Uh, I think any, any time of day is fine. I get patients to take it Mane. Yep. Any advice to use it with weekend binge trickers? Should they stop over the weekend? It's a good, good question. Um, <laughs> look, I think you, you you weigh it up, and in the normal patient, to be honest, they're probably going to be absolutely fine. If you're worried about the risk of DKA due to other factors, you may think about stopping it. You probably won't ever talk about binge drinking uh, yeah. itself. And well, most patients on vigilance are fine. What's the context of that? Um, there we go, we've got that one. Um, so we've, we've, we've probably still got another 20, 30 questions. How's your stamina, gentlemen? Oh, I'll keep going for a short time. Brian right, can step in if he wants okay. to. If you, if you want to show the flag, then um, then do. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, they're, they're still roaring in here. Um, does the new diabetes weekly injection have any advantages, Ken, compared to Jardians? Uh, it does. I guess in terms of evidence base, it reduces the risk of non-fatal stroke. Mm -hmm. um, or cerebrovascular disease, which SGL2 um, inhibitors don't um, to date. And it does lead to greater weight loss and probably greater glycemic control. Um, but it's saying that... Injectable weekly ones have up to about a 12 kg weight loss? Or yeah, they do. Um, with that, um, I mean, liraglutide or Saxenda, which lots of you be aware of, has been funded, or not funded, so it's available now for the treatment of obesity. For example, the weight loss, weight loss dose for that is three milligrams subcut per day compared to the diabetes dose, which is, is 1.8 uh, milligrams a day. So the, the, the benefits are, the, they are dose responsive in terms of for, for weight loss. We're only going to have the 1.5 milligram injections available in New Zealand for gelacotide. So we won't be seeing, I imagine that the weight loss that we're seeing with liraglutide, we'll still be seeing good weight loss, um, but it's just to, um, yeah, it's not going to be probably, it's not, not going to be a magic wand. Um, FDA sets the EGFR threshold at 45, but in New Zealand it's 30. Any yeah, it's 30. Um, the International Kidney Society's come out, I was, I think, middle of last year. And last year. We're using 30. So it used to be 45 mils per minute in New Zealand as well, but it's been changed. And we're just keeping in line with international guidelines. Should we be more cautious about starting if the patient has been on uncontrolled type 2 diabetic for a longer period, i.e. beta cells likely to have died and the risk of DKA? Yeah, I mean, you, you would be a little bit more cautious. Um, they are the sort of patients, though, that if they really got poor guys, I mean, we're talking about hp one cs greater than 100, mm -hmm. um, you might be thinking, of, I mean, I'll be starting insulin as well as embicophosin. Yep. Um, and the other ones you might choose to try and get under control first before um, starting embicophosin. Um, but it's really just about thinking, hey, if, if they've got that poor glycemic control, empagliflozin is really only, not really going to touch the sides mm -hmm. in terms of purely for glycemic control. Um, if galvanomet preserves insulin cells in the same way that metformin does, why aren't we encouraged to first maximise metformin and galvanomet before other meds? Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. I guess with... Um, 
it's more about when we look at, um, well, to be honest, it, the, the studies on the newer agents such as SGL and turn inhibitors and GLP-1 agents, whether they delay the need of insulin therapy is not known yet. They probably do, but we don't know that for sure. The thing about vertigliptin is that it doesn't offer any other benefits up and above um, glycemic control. So delaying the need for insulin therapy comes into, into that benefit. So if you want to reduce cardiovascular and renal risk, it's about adding in an SGL2 inhibitor or, or GLP-1 agonist when it becomes, becomes available. But for, for those patients which don't have renal cardiovascular disease, it's absolutely fine to go for vertigliptin as your second line agent. And I'd be encouraging patients to start it, start it. And you could, I mean, you could easily argue that, um, you know, all patients with type two diabetes, you could start on galbamet. Um, but it comes back to, are you going to, you know, you came back to your glycemic targets and thinking, what am I trying to achieve here? Um, patient with low BP, hundred systolic or less, has heart failure, maximum carvedilol, ACE, and bruzamide. Can I still start? SGLT2 inhibitor. Yeah, you can. I'll just be a little bit more cautious and warn the patient of the risk of hypotension. But here's a patient where you might be able to get them empagliflozin and wean off the, the dose of the frusamide a wee bit and their blood pressure stays okay. And the cardiologists don't, don't seem to be too worried about the low blood pressure. Oh, no, no, it's 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 really only minimal. And I mean, it's, about, it's, it's a normal blood pressure for someone with heart failure. We go get here you know, with everything else. So, yeah. Um, so it seems to be driving some general practice towards prescribe, promoting low carbohydrate diets for people in type two. Where does this fit in with current thinking in terms of pharmacological agents? Yeah, I, the only, this is about the only group, the SGL2 inhibitors, which will have, um, I guess, the potential for risk in, in that group. Um, if, I mean, to be honest, these are the guys that if you had to choose one between SGL2 inhibitor and GLP-1 agonist, you might be going for the GLP-1 agonist once it's available. Um, you obviously got the risk of potential risk of hypos in a low-carb diet, but SGL2 inhibitors are literally the only other medication where you think it, you think twice about it. Metformin, vertigliptin, GLP-1 agonist, absolutely fine. Um, Jardimate is a smaller tablet, apparently. Is that right? Yeah, I'm not... To be honest, I haven't checked. Uh, <laughs> if, so, if someone does know, I've got. Yeah, maybe Neil might be able to. I tell you, it was, I guarantee it's a smaller tablet than metformin. Yeah. And, and when you've got patients on a gram a day and they have to take two tablets of metformin twice a day, actually switching to something like Galvimet or Jardimet is a great way just to reduce the number of tablets, let oh. alone the size of the tablets. Yeah, well, that's a nice tip. That's a nice tip. Um, 48 questions left, and we're 30 minutes over. Um, and we're uh, about half the audience is gone. So, um, uh, so I wonder if we just go for another five minutes and then yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to keep going. Uh, we're going to have to have a session later in the year um, and maybe just do cases and questions. Um, I think there's just going to be an enormous amount of questions. Um, uh, um, okay. Well, um, so with UTIs, do you stop the drug? Um, any guidance about urinary tract infections? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably um, st stop and treat and restart when well. And if you're thinking, if you've got recurrent UTIs and you're thinking about, um, do you just can it altogether? Well, my, my, mouse is, my mouse has just given up. <laughs> That's getting tired. Yeah, that might be, that might be time. Um, oops. Just to um, just to call it a halt there. Well, that's been absolutely brilliant. So, um, so we've still got a lot of questions, but um, maybe we just have to do those um, at another thing later in the year. Um, but um, thank you very much, you two. I think that's been fabulous. Uh, very fabulous having fourteen hundred people sign up. So, um, so that was really great. So, I hope your mood is elevated, Paul, um, from answering all these questions. It's quite fun. No, thanks, Bruce. It was good fun. Yeah, yeah, lots of lots of good questions here. It's, it's good to see people interested as well. Yeah, yeah, and um, people are, are using the term SGLT two inhibitors. So, um, we're um, that, that that's quite an achievement. I think it took me a while. Um, so, thank you very much um, uh, to Ryan and Brian. Great to do this with you, and thank you for the audience. That's um, 
that's been absolutely fabulous. So, so good night to everybody.